I recognize that as I was preparing to, to speak today, that I would be speaking to people of all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of histories, and, uh, and may, people that I may not even know. I can recognize many of you from Strathmore Alliance Church, where I am a pastor, and uh, I do know that there are some here probably today that maybe go to another church, or maybe they are a Christian and they don't really go to church. And maybe there are some of you out there as well that just have a totally different view about God, about the Bible, and, and about how the world works. And so my goal here today, as it always is, is not to just come up here and tell you all about what I think, but it's to tell you uh, what God has communicated in the scriptures, in the Bible, so that those of us who hold to the teaching of the Bible will be equally encouraged today. And uh, for those of you that don't hold to the teachings of the Bible, at least you will discover the tremendous mercy that God has toward every single one of us in this world. And so I want to begin uh, just by, in the few moments that we have together this morning, I want to focus our attention on the very center of our faith. Indeed, the very center of what the Bible is all about, the salvation that God has made possible for us in Christ. And, and I think that if we boiled it down just, to just four words today, just four words, they would be this, that Christ died for sinners. And as I read this passage in Romans chapter 5, I want you to listen for those words. Christ died for sinners. So let's read Romans chapter 5, verses five, or 6 to 8. It says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now I'm sure you heard those four words. Christ died for sinners. But more than just hearing those four words, what difference do they make in our lives? How is this, those four words, the good news that, that forgives us for our sins and grants us eternal life? How does this make any difference in our lives today? And I want us to see in, this, in these few verses how there are two great depths that are mentioned or referred to here that make all the difference for us. The first depth is the depth of God's love. No doubt you've heard someone in your life at some time before tell you that they love you. And you've probably also learned that the more people talk or the more, more things that you've heard in your lifetime that you can realize how talk can be cheap. And so it doesn't matter that we just say that God loves you. We want to take the time to see it in action. How does God really love us? What is the living proof? Not just that he tells us this, but how has he shown this to us? And I want us to see this uh, at the beginning here. Now, my wife and I are uh, less than two weeks away from celebrating our 16th anniversary. And uh, it reminds me of that day that was 16 years ago when we stood before each other on a boiling hot August day. We were outdoors and we were there standing before each other declaring our love and commitment to one another. And I remember how she loved to hear the words that I was saying to her, how I was committed to her, how much I loved her. But at the same time, as much as those words, I meant those words. It's not just the words themselves that have sustained our marriage until this, this, this day. It's not just the fact that I would tell her every day that I loved her, but it was also the accompanying actions that showed that I loved her. I mean, I could tell her every single day, but if I never showed her, if I never showed her that how I loved her, then she would begin to doubt it. She wouldn't believe me that it was true. And in the same way today, just hearing the phrase, God loves you. I don't just want to say that, that that is a truth. I want to show you how much God loves you so that you can begin to measure how deep the Father's love really is for us. And it's found in those four words, Christ died for sinners. Let's begin with the first two words. They are Christ died and this is how God demonstrates his love for us. 
You think about how all the ways that you can show love to someone else. Let's say that I write the greatest love poem that has ever been written for my wife. That is a way that I could show her that I love her. Or, or maybe I, I hold her hand and encourage her through a difficult trial. Or maybe I pay off an incredibly high debt that she finds herself facing. Or maybe I free her from slavery or I rescue her from certain death. See, all of those things are acts of love, but not all of those things show the same amount of love, do they? They're not all equal. And so some of these things that we do in our lives that God has done for us show how much he really loves us. And that's because the way that we calculate the amount of love someone has for someone else is in how much it costs the person doing the action. And so I want to look at this here. Therefore, the greater the cost, the greater the love. And that's exactly what we see in Romans chapter 5. It tells us that God proves how much He loves us. He doesn't just say it, but He shows us in that Christ died. It cost Him everything. It cost Him His, his life. And not just his life or what he did, look at who it cost him, who it was that died. It was Christ. This is the title of the King and the Savior of God's people. He is the most significant person in the universe. And Jesus of, of John 3.16 is described as the Son of God. In fact, it was God's only Son. And because he's divine, he is infinitely more valuable than any human sacrifice that we could ever make. And so this shows us already to, to figure out how much God really loves us. The depth of his love is seen in not only that somebody died, but that it was his son, his beloved son. He didn't even hold him back from death for us. And so we begin to see how deep God's love is for us, freely choosing to give what would cost him the most. But that in itself is not good news. The fact that God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you isn't good, good news. It's actually useless if there was no purpose behind it. I mean, you, would, you wouldn't think it would it'd be an act of love if I gave up my only son to die if it didn't accomplish anything good. And so we need to realize that I mean, you'd have me thrown in prison. You'd have something even worse happen to me if I were to do that. Unless there was a good reason for it. And so we need to realize what it is that Christ died for. And here we have the next two words. For sinners. That Christ died for sinners. And this leads us to the second depth. The first one was the depth of God's love. And now we see the depth of our sin. And the Bible doesn't tiptoe around humanity's greatest problem, humanity's deepest problem. And whether we accept it or not, it's still true. Sin is anything that breaks our Creator's law. And of those three verses that I read earlier, this is how it describes us. It says that we are weak. This means that we are unable. We're not strong enough. We're unable to fill or fulfill God's moral commands. We are described as ungodly. As in, we have done what God does not like, what he hates. We have sinned. And we're called sinners. As in, we have fallen short of his moral standards. And we, are, um, we, we can try as hard as we can. But no matter how hard we try, we still fall short. We are weak. We are ungodly. And we are sinners. Perhaps a simpler, more personal way to think about whether we are sinners or not is to ask yourself this question. Do you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength? Because this is what God commands us to do. This is what God created us to do. And yet we don't. I mean, if we did, then we wouldn't be guilty of any sins, of any rebellion against God. But because we don't, we are called sinners. We fall short. And this isn't just myself. This isn't just you here today. This is everyone. And God sees way beyond our claims to be a good person or to be a good enough person or to be better than the person beside us. 
He sees through all of that. He, in fact, declares in Romans chapter 3 that no one, not one person, meets his standards. That all have turned aside. That everyone deserves the consequences of their sin. And so what do we expect if that's the case? I mean, when we, we hear of people who have committed the most atrocious acts, they've broken the law in ways that we couldn't even imagine. And what, what wells up inside of us is that sense of justice. We want justice, and we might even wish an equally horrifying punishment for people who have broken the law in certain ways. And similarly, the way that God... When we have sinned against an infinitely holy God, why would we be surprised if there is wrath and if there is death involved for our sin? Hell exists as the reason, as the arena where God's punishment, the wages of our sin, will be carried out upon us forever. And so that second depth is the depth of our sin, and it includes an insurmountable penalty of divine wrath. And so with those two depths, we've got the depth of God's love and we've got the depth of our sin. And the way we need to put these two things together shows us which one is greater. I mean, I think that oftentimes we, we hear these two sides. There's Christ died and then there is four sinners. And too often we get caught up on one or the other. We might think, oh, Christ died. God loves me, so I can't be that bad. Or maybe we hear the part about our sin. And we say, God, I'm so bad that God can't love me. But the Bible requires both of those things to come together. The depth of our sin and the depth of God's love. And in fact, only when those words are understood together, only when they are believed together, according to their biblical meaning, do they become the good news that packs the power of salvation for all who would believe. And so I want you to listen to those four words again. Christ died for sinners. And when you, when anyone recognizes yourself as a sinner, one who doesn't love God the way that he is required, the way that he deserves, one who doesn't obey his commands, but you've lived life your own way as a rebel against what he has required of us. And then you realize that one day you will stand before him and be judged according to His standards. That day is coming. But you already know today that you fall short. That you will be condemned on that day. But there is good news. And that good news is that God's love for you goes deeper than your depth of sin. And this is why He sent His Son into the world to die in our place. The verses I read earlier say that it's incredibly rare for someone to actually lay down their life for another person. We, we don't see that very often. It's an honorable thing, but it's extremely rare. And yet there we see that this is exactly why God demonstrates it in such a way. You, you'd think that if someone actually were to lay down their life for someone, it would be because they didn't deserve to die. It would be because they owed that person their life and oftentimes there's, a, there's an obligation that, yes, I will lay down my life there for another person. But in this verse, it says that God shows the depth of his love. And then it says this, in that while we were still sinners, we were still sinners. That is when Christ died for us. As we know, sinners deserve to die. They don't, God doesn't owe them anything good. Only punishment. And yet, while we were still his enemies, still ungodly, still too weak to obey him, still sinners, that is when Christ died for us. He paid the greatest price possible to rescue us from the eternal wrath that we deserve. And he did it by sending and putting, punishing His perfect Son in our place to save us. His love, we already measured it in what it cost Him, right? The death on a cross. And whom it cost Him? It cost Him His only Son. And now you add the fact that He did this for the most undeserving people. 
enemies of him, those who have rejected him, those who have hated him. And so do you see the depth of God's love toward us in knowing that it required the humiliation of taking on flesh, becoming like us, even though he was God, and living in a sinful world, and suffering at the hands of those he came to save, and dying a sinner's death, in their place for sins he didn't commit. And in this way, the two words, Christ died, is the best news that we could ever hear because of the two words, why he did it, for sinners. And so I want to leave you with these four words. The Christ died for sinners. He didn't wait until we were good enough or that we were close enough so that it would cost him less. No, the Bible says, that your salvation isn't about how much you love God, but about how much God loves you. And therefore, you don't save yourself. He saves you. And the Bible says that salvation is according to the incredible riches of God's mercy, that it is a gift through faith, not your own doing. And it's because Christ died to earn forgiveness for every single one of your sins that there is nothing you need to do except receive this free gift. And to do that, you must trust Him for it. The Bible says that your salvation is not by works, it is by faith. And it is by banking on nothing more and nothing less than Jesus Christ and His work for you. So those are the four words. Christ died for sinners. And if you are resonating with the depth of your sin today, but the even greater depth of God's love for you. Will you trust that Christ died for your sins to save you? Will you stop believing that you will be good enough with all your good works and your happy thoughts and your kind words to save you, to to make yourself look good in God's eyes and just receive from Him His gift, His grace, His Son, your sufficient and sovereign Savior? And for those of you who have responded, you've heard this good news, and perhaps many years ago you have responded in faith, you you should never look away from the depth of your sin. But even when you see that, you should always look and live clinging to Christ moment by moment in the depth of God's love. So will you cling to Him and fight the temptation to think that more than faith in Christ is needed to be saved, or that even less than Christ is needed to be saved. So those are the four words. This is the good news, the gospel, that Christ died for sinners. And thanks be to God for the immeasurable gift of His love towards people like us, sinners, though we are, Christ died for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way in which you have revealed to us your love. It's not just something that we can't measure. You've given us tangible ways that we can understand how great your love is for us. Not only do we hear this good news, we also know the bad news of how we have sinned, how we have failed, how we have not lived up to your design, and we've rejected you. But thanks be to God that his love for us is deeper still, that even after we have believed and trusted and received all that Christ is for us, you continue by dwelling in us to give us the power to help us to live the way that you have required. And so I pray that we would resonate with both these pieces, not only our sin, but even more so, your great love for us. We thank you that it is without price and that it has already been accomplished and that we can receive it for free through faith. I pray that we would would, uh, contemplate the gospel again today and that we would be overjoyed as we trust in you for it every day of our lives and look forward to the glory and the hope that we have because of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.